This poster for the original production of O'Neill's Strange Interlude might have led the audience to expect something with a touch of modern dance about it. Were they relieved to find something more conventional? Here is Lynn Fontane leading the original cast in a tableau I seem to remember. I couldn't have been there, of course. The experimental aspect was that there was no subtext. The characters spoke their private thoughts, often at some length, aloud. The onus was on the characters not speaking their thoughts, not to hear the one that was, if you follow. Here is the Hollywood version of the same moment, everybody suitably photogenic. Close-ups must have been handy in the film version to lose the person's not thinking, or at least not thinking aloud. And perhaps the thoughts were done as voiceovers anyway. Yes, I have been at a loss to explain O'Neill's use of spoken thoughts in Strange Interlude. But perhaps the clearest demonstration is the famous crude parody by Groucho Marx. If I were Eugene O'Neill, I could tell you what I really think of you two. You know, you're very fortunate the Theatre Guild isn't putting this on. And so is the Guild. Pardon me while I have a strange interlude. Why, you couple of baboons? What makes you think I'd marry either one of you? Strange how the wind blows tonight. It has a thin, eerie voice that reminds me of poor old Marsden. How happy I could be with either of these two if both of them just went away. Here am I, talking to myself in the street. I suppose we do speak our thoughts aloud to ourselves in the kitchen or the on the street. Um, I thought it was a little bit much to do it aloud in the theatre. And uh, I thought it was rather like, little does he know that I'm his father. You know, the famous uh, Victorian melodrama aside. That was the gist of some of the thoughts of Dr. Darrell, played in our 1984 to 5 production on the West End and on Broadway by Brian Cox. His thoughts silent in this dressing room study, I made it have been character. Little does he know. And here is the hapless Sam played by the late lamented James Hazeldean, who thinks the boy is his. I had wanted to be cast as Dr. Darrell, thinking I had played enough sexless heroes. But good old Charlie, abjectly in love with Nina, as they all are, turned, well, he's the abject one, turned out to be a great comedy part. Somebody who saw me on tour in Croydon, on the pre-London tour, with a silent deadly house, surprised me by telling me it was the best thing I'd done in years, and so funny. Here's Glenda, Glenda Jackson, in her Broadway dressing room. I photographed her. She has just stood down, uh, not in this photograph, but as my Member of Parliament this last month or so. I've been fond of quipping that I know the full weight of her political convictions. And there was always the moment when I had to carry her off stage. I was I'll carry her up to her room. This is the Nottingham Theatre Royal, as it is today, and how it was in 1984, a strange year, when we played what should have been the five hours of O'Neill's strange interlude on our pre-London tour. Here, the Saturday matinee was arbitrarily docked of two of the nine acts, Glenda Jackson having the brunt of the task as Nina, the femme fatale. And I still remember coming off stage after the curtain call and hearing the call, half an hour please, for the evening performance. This is how the theatre looked much earlier, circa 1900. It was in 1906 that the young D. H. Lawrence saw Sarah Bernhardt here, playing another femme fatale, La Dame aux Camellia, and after the final curtain, battered at an exit door to be let out. A wild creature, yes, a gazelle with a wonderful panther's fascination and fury. He sat in the circle, 
And I remember, during our rehearsals of Strange Interlude, sitting in several seats in case I might just happen to light on the one on which he had sat watching the Divine Sara. I took this overexposed photo in just such a rehearsal of Strange Interlude, perhaps from the very seat, but you can see our, dare I say, cloud-capped clapboard set. It was here in Glenda, speaking one of her longer thoughts in rehearsal on this stylish, non-realistic set, on this historic stage, that opened my ears to the spellbinding poetry of the play and her utterance of it. And talking of clapboard, what business had we when we played in New York to visit the O'Neill summer residence in London, Connecticut, where the actor O'Neill Sr. and his two sons had sat on this veranda? How could we tread on the same boards? I suppose I fancied my moustache made me look like the great playwright. But then he had taken us into this very room in Long Day's Journey into Night, smaller than any stage set of it I have seen, and yet the setting for the family dramas that he was to dramatize at the end of his life. And I fear that Charlie Lang, who played young Gordon in our play, and I did not resist peopling the room ourselves. I'm recording the fact. Mm-hmm.